without a mic? Yeah. I didn't go full tilt. Yeah, I think it would be distracting. To get started, um, I'm Tom Anderson. I'm the outreach director here for SB63 DFL. Um, I feel like we can, I'm going to get it started. I'd like us to do introductions to for Amy, and then I'll get go over rules, and we'll get started. Uh, my name is Amy Livingston. I'm the vice chair for Senate District 63. Um, I'll also be moderating with Tom here today. So we're going to have multiple rounds of questions. Uh, round one is going to be opening statements. We'll uh, start <laughs> down on that end, <laughs> and we'll make our way this way uh, for opening statements. Um, round two, uh, we generated questions um, from people ahead of time. We looked through those questions and tried to find questions that were maybe asked multiple times. Um, and then so we pulled those together into five questions. Um, so we're going to start for that round. We'll, be, we'll start down here on this end. Uh, question number one will be to Jerome, and um, then for the second question, we'll start with Eric and so on and so forth, so everybody gets an opportunity to start with a question and to answer second and third and fourth and last and so forth to try to make it as fair as possible. Um, round three, we'll get an opportunity to elaborate, starting down there, to elaborate on uh, anything that's been talked about or to talk about a subject that maybe didn't come up. If there's something that they're passionate about that didn't come up in the five questions, they'll get the opportunity to speak about that. Um, and each of those rounds are three minutes. Um, and then the final uh, closing statement is only a minute. Wrap it up as concisely as possible for your uh, closing statements. And again, we'll start with Emma and work our way down the next round for closing statements. Could you use the microphone? Uh, we're, we've uh, got a very short cord on the microphone. Um, but. So uh, if it, we're going to ask the candidates to do their opening statements in normal voice, but if people are having a difficulty hearing from uh, for round two and three and four, we can uh, switch to having them stand here. It's unfortunately not a very long board, I think is the issue, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, but if, if you have any trouble hearing, just uh, raise your hand at the end of round one and we'll, we'll make adjustments for that. All right, um, la uh, real quick pitch before we start. Um, we're happy to put this forum on uh, for all of you so we can hear from these candidates uh, before we go to caucus. Um, if you have the ability, we would love a donation just to offset the cost of this, being that we're just a small uh, Senate District Party unit. Um, all of this costs money, so anything you can pitch in would be really helpful. Um, the bucket's back there, otherwise you can talk to uh, Andrew in the back about digital payment options if you don't have cash. Um, otherwise, we'll set to go oh, set. Yeah. Just one question. Where, will this be posted anywhere? This is live? actually streaming live on Facebook right now, okay. and we'll be uploading it to our YouTube channel after um, after it uh, is over. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Good to go. Opening statements starting down at the end. Hi, I am Emma Greenman. Is that loud enough? Yes. Yeah. Um, I have a loud voice, me speaking back to the room as an organizer. Um, I am so excited to be running for uh, State House 
right here in 63B, uh, because I believe in the power of us, and I believe in the power of us to make a Minnesota where we all thrive. I got my start as an organizer on the Wellstone campaign, and that's where I fell in love with the power of politics and the power of organizing to change people's lives, to build community and to create change. Uh, building community and connecting across difference is something I learned when I was a uh, uh, young age. Um, my childhood was a little more complicated than a nine-year-old Emma probably would have cared to admit. Um, with my dad, I lived in the district over on 51st and Cedar, um, but not just there. I also um, lived on both ends of Cedar Avenue. With my mom, we moved around a lot, um, uh, and I will never forget the feeling of getting off uh, that waiting list for subsidized housing and moving over into the, the towers of Cedar Riverside. Um, the safety and security that that provided um, me, uh, I was in the first place that we could be together in a while. Um, and it also um, provided, allowed me to have my friends over and um, some safety and, and security with um, my mom as she struggled with her mental illness. Navigating between these worlds, um, I uh, experienced both comfort and poverty. And I learned that we have a long way to go to create a world where every kid in every part of the, the region and the state um, has what they need to survive and thrive. That's why I do the work I do. It's why I've spent my life as an organizer and as a voting rights lawyer, working to center the needs of communities and of kids and of folks often left at the margin. It's why now as a voting rights lawyer, I'm working at Center for Popular Democracy, I've been working to expand community voice and have fought to restore the right to vote in Florida and Maryland, fought voter suppression in Arizona and in Georgia, um, where I was down there for Stacey Abrams' 2018 race, some of the worst voter suppression I've ever seen. And here in Minnesota, working to protect the vote and get dark money out of our politics. 2020 is a make or break moment for our democracy. And while Trump fans the flames of fear and division and hate, and the Republicans both here and in Congress follow his lead. Um, here in Minnesota, we're building power for a different future. I know we'll have a lot of time tonight to discuss the issues, um, and I'm excited about that. And I will say that before we can tackle those issues, we have to start by repairing and reimagining our democracy. That's the work I wanna do. That's the work I wanna do together here in the district and at the Capitol. And that's why I'm running and hope to earn your support. Thank you. So, um, my name <clears throat> is Tyler Moroles, and um, you know I'm running for the Minnesota House of Representatives in this district, 63B, where I was born and raised. My story is like that of many other Minnesotans, but it's a story that oftentimes is not reflected in our government. Uh, my father was a Mexican-American Chicano uh, migrant worker who grew up in a migrant working family, living from shack to shack, living as a second-class citizen his whole life. And you know, because of marijuana prohibition, he was kicked out of school in his senior year in the last week, while everyone else was given a clear because of the color of their skin versus my father's. Then he um, you know, worked hard and became a postman, and then uh, later was addicted to opioids and died when I was only two years old. My mother, who's in the crowd right now texting. <laughs> uh, I love you, Mom. <laughs> uh, uh, my mother worked really hard to raise us four kids uh, in the same house I grew up in in Minneapolis, South Minneapolis. And uh, you know she worked every day at a nursing home trying to provide for us to make sure that we have housing stability here. And I was lucky enough to go to South High and uh, go Tigers, and then um, uh, Columbia University, where I earned my master's degree in political science and economics. Um, and then I decided to come back here uh, because you know this is home. And I worked in the Minneapolis uh, Public Housing Authority, and uh, now I manage the Community Development Block Grant Program in Hennepin County. Uh, and I've worked in this community uh, to serve us because you know right now we're going through a crisis. And I chose housing because, um, look, we have to deal with this crisis immediately. Right now, Minnesota is the 51st in this country when it comes to home ownership uh, inventory. Uh, we have some of the worst inequalities we see with home ownership with people of color and white folks. And the ability for me to grow up in this community in this zip code of 55407, just north of here, 
uh, was one of the reasons why I had such a lucky time and I was, su I was afforded the opportunities to live and go to uh, great schools and stuff like that. Further, uh, so you know, we need to fight for housing, and that's one of the reasons why I'm fighting for this campaign. But also because you know our environment is really in a challenge right now. We need to combat climate change, and we need to do it now. So I will absolutely fight to uh, go carbon free in the future. And then further, finally, you know, we have to fight for immigrant rights because right now we have Trump appointees in an immigrant uh, courts in our districts to set at deporting our neighbors. And the Democrats, I'm sorry, but when we had the House and all uh, of, of branches in office, we did not get it done in 2010 to fight for driver's licenses for all, and I will do that. So I'm fighting for all of us, and please, uh, that's why I'm running this campaign. Thank you. Woo! <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Nia Dick Bradley, and um, I'm running for the Minnesota State House 53 B. I was raised in this area. My parents moved here um, from Cincinnati and they moved to Chicago. <coughs> and they were very involved in a lot of voting rights and marches. My, when my dad um, came to Minnesota, we had a lot of different troubles that we had to go through, definitely um, with the, gov the um, US government and having to deal with a lot of housing issues and with, um, was definitely like with um, like public assistance, like we had to rely a lot on the government at that time. Um, during that time, my dad was lucky to get a job with the Postal Service, U.S. Postal Service, and um, he had to help the union workers fight for a lot of the union rights. And so that's where I started to learn more about um, canvassing and also marching for different rights and speaking our voices up about different things that were happening in our area. After that time, we moved in um, on 43rd in Chicago, and during that time, we dealt with a lot of different issues, like environmental issues, um, it, which are similar to what some of the issues that are going on in homes today. So we had a lot of flooding in our basement um, at that time, and then the city of Minneapolis decided to knock down two blocks of homes in order to release the pressure from the lagoons um, where the water was flowing underneath the home. We were forced kind of like out of our home to move into a different part of the district at that time. And since then, I've paid a lot of attention to a lot of issues that are going on, especially with the environmental water issues, because I've seen the evolution um, of how, what it caused people back then in the 1980s until now. And I've also seen a lot um, of homes that were destroyed because of the issues. After that time, I was, you know, I went to North High School when I was in the Cinematech Magnet studying science, math, and technology. And then after graduating, I went to Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia, and was um, a chemist coming out of college. Since then, I've been a lawyer, so I've worked at, at um, Thompson Reuters and then currently in the school system, helping with career professional development. And, um, and so I'll continue to help out everyone in the state on different issues um, because I've been trained as a generalist and I know how to tackle different things. I've also helped out on different campaigns, both state, national, and local. And um, that has definitely spearheaded me into running for my place. I am Eric Ferguson, fergusonforhouse.com. And if you know me, it's probably because I was chair of the Senate district for three terms. And if you don't know me, you're very comfortably in the majority because most people have not a clue who the chairs are. And I'm justifiably very modest about that. <laughs> So while I am proud of what I've done as chair, I'm running on what I'm proposing to do if I'm elected. <coughs> big problems require big ideas, and I'm offering some big ideas. Uh, for example, if we're going to allow renewable sources of energy to replace fossil fuels, we have to deal with the problem of renewables not providing base load power. If we, you want more fuel from your fossil fuels, you can shovel more coal in the furnace as you need to, but you can't make the wind blow 
or the sunshine at the times that you need it. They will flow and, sun and, and shine when we don't need the power and not the other way around. We need a means of energy storage. And probably we're going, going to have battery technology to do this eventually, but global warming isn't waiting for eventually. I'm proposing that we invest in an existing technology called pumped hydro. So when power is produced when we don't need it, rather than, than just disconnecting the solar cells from the grid, we use the power to push water up to a reservoir, and then when we need to turn it back into electricity, we release the water, and it runs over hydro turbines to recreate the electricity. The core issue with our chronic housing shortages is that we don't have enough space for as many people as want to live here. We just need more space to build housing. And something that we forget about is that everywhere the freeways are, those used to be neighborhoods. The construction of the freeways tore out neighborhoods, tore out a lot of housing. And for example, Minneapolis right now is having trouble housing a bit over 400,000 people. At its peak, it had over 500,000 people. That was in 1950, and that was before the freeways were built. I'm proposing that we cover the freeways. Anywhere the freeways were built in trenches, we can put a roof over them, and that turns them into tunnels, and then we can build on the roofs, and we recreate some of the housing that was lost. I have a free college plan I call Commit to Minnesota to solve the problems of both stu uh, students getting their educations and leaving the state, or maybe skipping education altogether because they're afraid of the debt post-secondary education required them to take on, or their debt affects everything that they do in life. In, with Commit to Minnesota, college or any post-secondary education will be free if students commit to living in Minnesota for five years after they leave school. So in five years, they'll have gotten their lives in order and they'll want to stay here. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. How's it going? Good. 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 Uh, my name is Jerome Evans, and I just want to start with a quick note of gratitude. Thank you all for coming out, taking time out of your Monday to get to know a little bit more about your candidates. Thank you to the Dems for putting on this forum, and of course, thank you to the Community Center the gentleman here earlier uh, for, a, for hosting. So over the course of this evening, we really only have little short bites. And so um, when you get to hear from me, I hope what you hear uh, are, my, are my values, my priorities, and my qualifications, okay? So very quickly, a quick bio. Uh, I grew up in Atlanta. I went to college at Georgia Tech. I graduated in three years at the top of my class and two weeks later, I went to law school. I practiced law for a few years in Atlanta, did well enough to say, okay, how can I get out of Georgia? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I was really lucky uh, to find this community, because how often do you find a community whose values align with your own personal values? Hard work, integrity, caring for each other. I was very lucky in that way. I was also lucky in that I'm able to devote a lot of my uh, personal time to serving the community. So I chair the Nokomis East Neighborhood Association. Uh, it's 13,000 member, a resident strong organization, all dedicated to outreach. I co-chair the Public Health Advisory Committee for the city of Minneapolis. And my closest neighbors trust me to steward their money when they elected me over objection to be the president of my condo association. <laughs> now, I'm lucky in a third way as well. Uh, this community is where I met my partner, Aaron, who's right there. And we are currently a family of two, officially a family. We get the family size pizza. <laughs> um, but now it's time uh, for us, now that we're adults, we're thinking about growing our family. So, you know, you put your dad hat on, you start really taking a look at the community, and I came across some data, and the data is disturbing. If we have a child that looks like me, and we put them through the, our public education system, they will receive a lower quality education than if they look like Karen. And that 
does not align with our values. So I'm running to make our policies align with what we really believe. Because right now, that's just not the case. Thank you. Uh, doing a quick sound check, for those who are in the back, are you able to hear okay? Or should we switch to the microphone? Okay. All right, thanks. All right, so we're moving to the next round. Thank you. Um, we're going to go in our class questions. Uh, we're going to start down at this end and make our way back down to Emma. So Jerome, we'll get your first question. Uh, what will be your first piece of legislation? What influences that focus? And if the GOP keeps the Minnesota Senate, how will the legislation pass? Well, thank you. OK, so this is a really, uh, Great question, and it ties right into that education focus that I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, the first piece of legislation that I'm going to propose, I've already detailed on my website, jerometadams.com. It's called the Minnesota Hope Scholarship. And it provides a pathway for low-income students of whatever uh, ethnicity to get into college uh, in Minnesota without having to pay for tuition. Now, it's funded either by um, well, the funding's not such a big deal. Um, it's funded either by a lottery, a new lottery, or marijuana sale. Now, the reason I say it's not such a big deal is because I um, joined an education policy fellowship, and I had the uh, chief fiscal analyst for the state uh, present to my group on the budget, and it turns out that the amount of money it takes to send every kid with good grades into college, it's not that much. Um, compared to some of the other big ideas that you're gonna hear today. Uh, my napkin math put it at roughly $200 million a year, um, keeping in mind that right now we're running at about a $700 million per year surplus, a 1.3 for the financial. Okay? So that, that'll be it, jeromecevans.com, and you'll get the details. Um, it shows you, tells you what it is, why we need it, and how we'll pay for it. Well, when I walk into the legislature, I'm going to be a new freshman legislator walking in thinking I know everything. So after the legislators give me a reality deep down, I am going to be aware that I, like, I would love to push my big ideas through right away, but that it's going to take time to explain them, to build support, and I would like to get something passed right away. And there's actually a very local problem I think is very solvable. Um, part of Bridgefield, is underneath the airport flightways. And it was it's supposed to be a temporary change and maybe it only affects a small part of the city, but it's affecting it a lot. As somebody who lived underneath airport noise when I lived by Boston Park, wow, am I aware of how much you, in, you know, certain times of day, you know, you're not gonna be able to have a phone call or an outdoor conversation. So I was helped a lot by just noise mitigation. Better windows and air conditioner, basically, is what it took, and it makes it it can make a very big difference. So for those few hundred folks maybe in Richfield, there's a chance to make a big difference. Noise mitigation's not that freaking expensive. We can afford that little bit of money to make their lives tolerable. So I think that would be the first thing I would, pick, I would take up. It's something that's kind of small. And I hope we can get it done right away.
but if we can also do that on um, 62 and widen out the freeway um, by getting or something on with some of the homes and being able to <coughs> have other parts of transportation going through there as far as not only the orange line, but also having a faster train that's coming um, kind of like over Portland Avenue, that would definitely ease some of the, of the congestion and some of the transportation issues. And I would work with um, the GOP, I guess in keeping the Minnesota Senate, um, well, if they keep the Minnesota Senate and work with them to make sure that we have funding for the transportation project, because that would be helpful. Like if we can get more funding for those, for this area, then we could have um, a more mobile society or district. So um, I'm gonna go under the uh, idea that this is sunshine and rainbows land as a freshman legislator and I can get anything I want done. Uh, <laughs> so um, first of all, I would propose a sweeping housing plan because uh, that's one of the main reasons why I'm running in this campaign. Uh, I will first promote uh, and push for renter's bill of rights that includes um, you know, uh, advance notice of vacating and not vacating for no reason, uh, making sure that they have tenant protections out, um, to them, especially a tenant defense fund to make sure that we actually, um, you know, when you look at eviction lines, uh, you know, usually landlords have the lawyers and tenants do not. Uh, then further on top of that, I would double the amount we start, we are fund funding right now with the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency because currently right now we give them $90 million a year as opposed to police state aid that gets $148 million a year, which is virtually double if you do the math, and then also $90 million a year doesn't really get you much. And the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency is two times more likely to give a direct home buyer assistance loan to a household of color versus the private market. Then I will absolutely set up, um, you know, part of my housing plan will be reducing the pressure of property taxes on folks because right now a lot of seniors that are trying to age in place are getting pushed out of their homes because they can't afford the property taxes that they are currently having right now. So a progressive property tax, uh, uh, renters protections and a renters bill of rights and fully funding the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency and doubling their amounts. And how am I going to pay for it? Well, uh, glad you asked. Uh, because, <laughs> because um, you know, police state aid, we are giving too much money to the police departments to shoot down black and brown folks without warrant. And we need to hold them accountable. Uh, also, there's a lot of uh, waste when it comes to that. Further, uh, we have given $800 million to Delta, which was Northwest Airlines before, in a, in a tax break, a corporate tax break. So you can't tell me that we can't find this money somewhere. Uh, further, uh, you know, if the Republicans have the state uh, Senate, then I will have worked with them, and I'm sure that they will find it uh, to their liking to uh, also take the pressure off of a lot of the seniors that are aging in place in their district uh, with property taxes. Because when you look at the red districts, primarily they are, um, you know, they tend to be older and uh, they tend to be more homeowners. And uh, I think that that would resonate in a lot of communities across the, uh, Minnesota. Because um, so those are the issues I would tackle firsthand. Uh, because you know I have worked in affordable housing my whole professional career, and by managing the community development block grant program, and I know how to get it done. And everyone needs a home. Everyone needs shelter. And I need to I need to fight for this. That's why I'm in this race. Thank you. Um. I would start, and I think where we have to start, by repairing and reimagining our democracy, because we can't get any of the rest of this done if we continue to live in a democracy both here and across the country where uh, there are attacks that are sa looking to silence our collective voice. Right now, we're winning on big progressive issues, and we're not able to get it done. When you look at uh, common sense gun violence legislation, when you look at issues of, um, of criminal justice reform, when you look at issues of um, uh, uh, clean energy, 100% clean energy, what is holding us back is a, a concentrated attack on our democracy. So starting with legislation, this is the work I do across the country and here at home. I think what we should start with is uh, restoring the right to vote so that everybody has access to the ballot and that folks can be um, at the decision-making table when we're making decisions. That's where 
um, we need to start. We also need automatic voter registration and pre-registration for 16 and 17 year olds um, so that where everybody um, can automatically register to vote and we're getting above uh, uh, our 70% and getting up to 90 or 100% voting in Minnesota. We need to take on the issues of, of big money that's holding us back. And we know that's happening not just for on the Republican side. We know that that's what's kept us from disclosure laws um, with the NRA and then MCCL. So we have to ensure that we know everything, um, every dollar that's being spent on ads, um, independent candidates, we, those should be disclosed. We can do all of these things in an omnibus legislation bill. I think that this is the key issue. Then we have to go and do all of the other things. I think we, many of us, I think all of us on the stage probably agree with a lot of the bold progressive issues that we need to advance. But if we don't start and um, ensure that our collective voices are, are heard, that's the work I do. I spend my time in Minnesota and across the country trying to pass these kinds of legislation and the people we're fighting, whether it's preemption, whether it's attacks on unions, whether it's issues of um, the voter suppression we're seeing. We just saw today, or this weekend, um, the Sen Senate Republicans said that they're gonna bring back voter ID. That's not just happening here. That's a part of what's happening all over the country. It is about going after our ability to make decisions together. And that is why we have to um, focus on these issues and ensure that communities, and when we talk about communities, um, uh, it means communities in local, state, and at the, we will have to go to the federal level. When I wanna talk about the Senate, I think that we can beat, we can win the Senate, and then we have to be prepared to go in and do all of these things. Because we can, and there's the energy in this in this district and at the state. Um, we have to be ready to go do that. Okay, so this uh, next question, we'll, we'll start with Eric, and then go to Husnia, Tyler, Emma, and then Jerome. Uh, what is your strategy to improve public safety in the neighborhoods of 63B? This has actually come up a few times as I've been calling prospective caucus attendees, asking their support, and consistently what they're talking about is safety on mass transit, um, especially when after there are incidents on the light rail that make the news. And a lot of people see incidents that don't make the news, but they witness them, and that's scaring people off the light rail trains. And I guess the troublemakers on the trains haven't aren't aware of the improved cameras. They don't know what the things on the ceiling are. <laughs> but there, there is maybe the problem that that will help to solve a crime after the fact. We could use more deterrence. And I remember light, riding light rail trains. Um, the fare checks used to be fairly frequent. And I certainly noticed that the transit cops would go all through the car and they wouldn't find a single fare skipper. So I guess I can see why they cut back on the fare checks if it, if it wouldn't be you know, financially viable. But I suspect that their pr the presence of transit cops deterred a lot of bad behavior that's right now making people scared to use mass transit. So one simple thing was put more uh, transit cops on there, just do, just do fare checks. And even if they're not catching fare jumpers, I think that's going to cut down on incidents, make everybody feel more comfortable and, we're, and, and if you're not a light rail user, haven't followed the issue, what's worrying people, it's, it's minor things like people who insist on smoking despite not smoking or play the noise loud, right down to people picking fights and pulling out knives. So I think that's something that fairly simple to do that we can do in a short time that will have a very substantial effect. Um, I, like Eric, have heard a lot of the common complaints um, from different residents as I've called throughout the district. I have worked in public safety probably for 10 years um, at IKEA, and so I have a lot of experience with a lot of safety checks and safety things and um, in dealing with the operations of safety around an area. And I think that definitely the idea of having more people, um, either it be cops or volunteers or someone that can walk through the train and um, check to make sure that everything's going okay, but also having a presence to make sure that if anything happens, that somebody can respond to it very quickly. I think that a lot of the issues occurring on um, with public safety have to do with economics 
and the fact that certain people, like especially right now, since we have so many disparities in the state of Minnesota, and there's a large amount of people, especially people of color, that are, have not been able to attain jobs, um, they're jumping on the trains and they're either sleeping on there or they're using that as an avenue to get money or get things like valuable things from people in order to sell it. And so I think another way to help with public safety <coughs> would be com coming up with more job programs in our district and even in the state where, um, and that's where transportation comes into play because if we have more, a more transit society, and of course, like we're coming out with the D-line and other um, forms of transportation that will help with the environment and with the climate change issue, then you're able to move around the state a little bit more fluid. And you can go from one area to the other, like if someone wants to come and work at the Mall of America, then they're able to get here quicker and they're able to get here without having a car. And for a lot of the positions that are open, since there is, even though we're having high unemployment in, um, with people of color, there are a lot of open positions that are left un unfilled. And one way to do that is to help make the um, neighborhood more mobile so that people can get around and get the jobs. And then that would keep them more busy where they wouldn't have time to mess with other people on public transit and, um, and wreck their lives. So definitely, I think, with, um, with transportation that will help putting in more jobs for people, but getting rid of and helping with improving public safety will help with people having more jobs or more people that have jobs. So when we, when we think of uh, public safety, um, what I don't want uh, to happen is more black and brown people <laughs> are arrested and locked up uh, for reasons that Oftentimes, you know, young folks make mistakes. We all do. Uh, what I've seen is that, um, you know, we have now a criminal justice system that is unjust and that is not applying the law fairly across uh, racial et ethnic lines. Uh, what I see is that we have a prison system that does not pay at all. It pays 25 cents an hour, and uh, that's slave wages to me. And so um, one of the first things I will do is push for increasing a minimum wage uh, for those currently incarcerated. Um, and uh, when it comes to public safety, we can't talk about public safety without alleviating poverty. The people that we see that are living on the trains are homeless. And we need to actually fully fund um, homeless shelters and start building more because right now there's a need and people are dying right now because of their lack of access to shelters. That's why they're sleeping in the trains. Uh, you know, in this district, we've seen a lot of property crime, and the reason that there's property crime is because there's desperation, and let's not criminalize desperation. Let's find ways that we could expand the economic uh, pie to include households that have been previously incarcerated that can't find a job, for immigrants that are undocumented and don't have access to a social security number and can't get a job to young folk that haven't been turned and taught the ways of uh, a white work office that don't understand the nuances that there are and that can't get a job when they're interviewed. Uh, a lot of the times that we see these issues, we, we see the symptoms, but we don't see the cause. And I want to address the cause of it. And also on top of that, let's talk about the shooting of Brian Quinones, who was shot within 16 seconds of being out of this car and in front of his, his daughter, I mean his son, and in front of his wife. Um, now, I think that we need to make sure that every single police officer has body cams on them at all times. And I wanna mandate that in the state level. I wanna make sure that we have people that uh, you know stop someone that looks like me and doesn't ask for, for uh, immigration papers immediately, like a sanctuary state status. So um, I think that we need to start investing in communities that are hurting right now. And I think we need to start building more housing. You know, I've, I've helped develop a housing for ex-offenders that left prison and that came into, um, you know, they had a job lined up and uh, they were doing a training program in prison. They came out and they had a studio lined up for them so they could get back on their feet. And if you have a prison minimum wage, then you can actually increase your savings so you have some money coming out when you leave prison and you can get yourself established. Because right now, 
we don't have that. My uh, half-sister's mother is homeless right now in California because she was a firefighter uh, in the California prison system, but she never, never got an opportunity to become a real firefighter in California, and that's why she's homeless right now. So I'm fighting for the issues, and that's what I say about public safety. Everyone deserves to be safe, and we need to make sure that we have a system that uh, does that. Black, brown, indigenous, white. We need to have a, uh, a system that uh, keeps people safe. And in this um, in this uh, district, I think what that means is as we think about the, the property crimes issues and all the stuff we're talking about, we should be thinking about um, what are the alternatives that we have to policing. I know that there's folks in this room who do neighborhood watches to, to, to think about property crimes. I was a public defender earlier in my career, and I saw the amount of folks who, you know, when you're when you're early PD, um, you do a lot of the, the low level stuff in this community and gross misdemeanors. And the over policing that happens in black, brown, and indigenous communities meant that I had a lot of clients who came in for stuff like a little bit of weed, came in for stuff like uh, loitering. Um, and we need to ensure that one, we're not criminalizing poverty, and two, we're not criminalizing mental illness, and three, that we are actually um, creating a, a, a justice system. Um, that keeps people and communities safe. We also need to deal with the fact that, that we have a ton of guns in our, in our uh, communities and we need to pass uh, uh, common sense gun safety legislation. We need to pass red flag laws. Though that should be on day one and two. We gotta get that done. Um, we, we can't live in a state where kids have to do these drills and are terrified of having guns in their schools. Um, I also think, and this is this comes from my background um, as uh, a voting rights lawyer, <coughs> my touch point is that people should be able to make decisions over the, the stuff that happens in their own lives, in their own communities, in their own schools. That means we have to restore the vote, as I said, because when we're talking about criminal justice reform, we need to <coughs> ensure that we're centering the voices of formerly incarcerated folks. We did it in Florida. We should be able to do it here. There's a movement of folks who've been working together for, for 10 years, um, we gotta get that, that done, and I think, I think we will. Um, and I think we also need to think about the investments we're making. We should be investing in kids, we should be investing in communities, <coughs> we should be investing in all of the things that help people survive and thrive. That is actually what increases our public safety, we know that, we can read the research. Um, and so as a state, and as a community, when we think about Minneapolis and Richfield, we should be focusing on those issues as we think about uh, public safety. <coughs> okay, well, new page. Um, you know, I read this question and I developed, I started developing a pretty pragmatic response, <coughs> right? Um, we have a long-term problem <coughs> that our current system is producing people who do not have access to positive economic outcomes, right? Because I can tell you now, if you go down anywhere in Minneapolis and see someone who's committing a crime and you promise them $1 million, they will stop committing the crime. If you promise them $1 million over 30 years, which is $50,000 a year, which is attainable, and they will not commit those crimes. But our education system does not produce students or adults who are capable of getting these jobs and keeping these jobs, right? Now, short term, uh, I was just at a public safety meeting with Inspector McGinty and Council Member Johnson, and we had conversations about the way our police officers are deployed around the third precinct in particular. And there are some, in my mind, some management issues that can be taken care of. Um, so in addition to having a conversation with uh, the council person later on that week at Den Brewing, I had a conversation with the dispatcher and if uh, a crime occurs, say at Walgreens, because apparently Walgreens is the spot sometimes, um, the officers, they respond from anywhere around the city, right, just depending on their availability, and then they are stuck there for an unknown amount of time, right? Because the crime line has to come, they have to set out the cones, they have to do all of this stuff. In the meeting with uh, Councilperson Johnson, it was a, he voted a really good idea. Why does it have to be an officer that's there waiting for the crime lab to come, right? 
Why do we have, we don't need to employ a million dollar officer to sit around and wait for someone to do the rounds. We need to have uh, some other kind of employee dedicated to tasks like that who can free up our officers to go around the district, okay? Now that is not just a matter of deterrence. Um, it's also a matter of getting, getting these uh, criminals caught. Now, I had my bike stolen recently. So this is personal for me. <laughs> we caught their face on camera. We caught the license plate on camera, right? And I have access to that because I'm president of the condo association. <laughs> and the officers are so busy that they did not have time to even investigate the crime with the face and with the license plate, right? Now my time is about up. I'm sorry about that, but maybe we can talk more about that later because I can get passionate. <laughs> All right, and then we're on to the third question of the evening here, and then we'll move our way back around to the drum floor. So, in recent years, there have been many examples of shortages in public health care and crisis services. The measles outbreak, the opioid crisis, and increasing traffic in emergency rooms indicate a need for change on these issues. What proposals do you have for addressing health care needs and crisis services? Well, that's one of the reasons why I'm running is definitely to help eliminate the disparities that we have going on in healthcare with people with disabilities, LGBTQ, and others, and to help um, with the legislation, like help fund it in an equitable manner. For healthcare and the crisis services, like I, I know that um, we definitely need policies where we allow more home visits um, from nurses and then also hiring of nurses. And right now there's currently proposals going on and, um, where they're hiring more nurses of color, people of color, and other people that are able to deal with a lot of different crisis um, situations. And I think that since um, emergency rooms are getting full and they're often, they often have a long wait time, I know, like when my mother had to go to the emergency room, it took her a long time to be seen by a doctor. And for some people, especially depending on what type of condition you're in, if you're having a heart attack or if you're having trouble breathing, if you're waiting for a long time to be seen, um, definitely that exasperates the issue and you become sicker from that. And I think that if people are able to call a nurse or a doctor tell them their symptoms, and if nobody is available to help them at the hospital, then someone should be able to visit their home, and that we should have a policy um, that covers mental health <coughs> services as well. So um, definitely, like I would go for policies that would help, um, it help relieve the pressure in emergency rooms. Um, and then, okay, what else do I have for addressing healthcare needs? Um, for the healthcare needs, for there's different people that require different prescriptions and different prescription loads. And so I would have people that are licensed to be able to administer the prescriptions to be able to deliver those to people that are running out of, of prescriptions that just need to fill it for a couple of days because now there's a lot of restrictions on who can administer prescriptions and who can actually, um, well, who can pick it, it up for different people depending on if you're related to them or if you have their social security number or other ID. So I would definitely help in, or uh, have a policy that helps in that manner. So um, this topic is uh, quite personal for me. Uh, I lost my father uh, to opioid addiction. Uh, he was addicted to heroin. And, uh, you know, mom knows this, but it was impacted me the rest of my life, of course. And um, with that, we have many victims that are uh, black and brown that were criminalized. But now that it's a different demographic that's addicted to opioids, we view it differently. And uh, now we should really treat it as a public health crisis that it is and drug abuse in general as a, a public health crisis, not criminalize those who are addicted to uh, opioids or any other type of drug. 
for that matter. So making sure that, that we don't throw more people in jail for being victims of addiction uh, is one. Uh, further, uh, I'm fully on board with John Marty's plan to sign on to uh, single payer health care for all uh, because I believe that that is really the only way that we could have a, uh, a cost efficient uh, health care system that's not, uh, you know, uh, motivated by you know profits, motivated by making money, m motivated by boardrooms, uh, but instead brought down to a human level that everyone deserves health care no matter what, full full stop. And to do that, you know, you say how could you pay for it? Well, we paid for many wars, we paid for corporate welfare, we paid for the stadium, the Viking stadium. So I'm not really um, you know buying that argument. I feel like. The, the, the benefit outweighs the cost by a long shot. And when you see that Canada actually uh, provided uh, single payer healthcare to all, it was only because one of the provinces started with that. And then that kind of spread because, um, you know, uh, just everyone liked that. And now we go across the border to get insulin from Canada. So I believe that, um, you know, single payer is the way to go. I'm all on board for it. Also, we have to deal with our seniors because we are going through a senior uh, silver tsunami right now. Uh, senior poverty in suburban Hennepin County has increased 25% from 2011 to 2017, not counting 2018, 2019, and now 2020. So uh, what we have to do is make sure that uh, there's more senior care available, that we could you know, make sure that um, you know, their housing needs are met with um, accessible housing and accessible transportation because the bulk of the cost of uh, me uh, our uh, medical system and healthcare system is seniors. And so we need to take care of them. We need to make sure that we invest in it and fully, um, you know, invest in all types of ways that we could help out seniors from, from senior centers, senior uh, care and housing, and then also transportation as well. Uh, so that's what I'll do, and uh, also I'll take the opioid uh, companies to task, just like Oklahoma did, and make sure that they pay for the, what they've done to a lot of our families. Uh, so thank you so much. For, for healthcare is a human right, and everyone deserves access to quality, affordable healthcare, and healthcare that folks can afford to use, which more and more is, is becoming a problem. Um, my sister's a nurse, and so we usually start our conversations with some horrendous story about what health insurance companies are doing. Um, the most recent one was she had a patient who was 80 with dementia who had some abdominal surgeries, and both her, the nurse, and the surgeon said that the person needed to stay, this woman needed to stay in rehab longer, um, but the health insurance company wouldn't let her stay. She went back, and two weeks later, she ended up in the ER. Bad outcomes for her, also bad outcomes, more expensive. So when we think about emergency care and all of those things, it's actually costing us far more money and people are sicker. Um, we have to get the profits out of our healthcare and use that money to take care of people. We have to keep people healthier and we have the resources to do it. Um, here in Minnesota, um, we have to get on a path of single payer through the Minnesota Health Plan. And we also have to do things right now, like expand Minnesota care. And you know, here in Richfield, you have to know, you know, this is where Alex Smith is from, um, and he died because he didn't have access to affordable health uh, insulin. We need to pass Mike Howard's bill right now um, uh, because people shouldn't have, to, everybody should have access to insulin. We also need to use the purchasing power of the state to ensure that we're lowering the cost of prescription drugs. All of these things need to be on the path to single payer. We need to get the profits that are going to health insurance companies and the, the tons of money in lobbying, there's tons of money in, in, um, in, in politics that these healthcare companies are using. That money should be going to take care of people, to keep people healthier. And, and we will be able to do it for both kids at the earliest part of their lives and also um, all the way up to, to seniors. And so that's, uh, I think in Minnesota we can do that and ensure that everyone has affordable healthcare and healthcare that they can afford to use. So, first of, all, first of all, I am fully on board with getting Minnesota to single payer healthcare. It's 2020, it's way past time. The amount of money in our healthcare system that uh, doesn't pass the smell test, that's <coughs> dedicated to corruption, 
Um, we need to get that out of there, 100%. Now, I serve as co-chair on the Public Health Advisory Board for the City of Minneapolis. So uh, most of the time I sit next to Gretchen Musicant, um, commissioner for uh, the Minneapolis Health Department, whose mother lives in the district, by the way. And um, she has voiced frustration with the lack of attention that the state gives issues of public health. Um, and I think that you, as Minneapolis and Richfield and Hennepin County taxpayers, uh, you may notice that your taxes go up on a regular basis. And that is because we, on the hyper-local level, are stepping up to, to enact programs that the state should be enacting, right? See, we're talking about big, big issues, like housing, for instance. We know the data says that if you give someone a home, then you will spend less money over time on emergency services, right? But we make the choice on a state level not to properly invest in housing. It's all related, right? Um, in addition, I think we have an issue of readiness that we need to address. The question specifically refers to the measles outbreak and the opioid crisis. Um, and I think the common denominator there is that when these uh, instances or, or trends are heard, you could add vaping to this list, we're not ready for them, right? We do not have coordinated responses to foreseeable events. So I propose infusing our public health system with the funds required to stabilize us in the event of an emergency. Okay. Thank you. Well, I think our core problem is to have fundamentally a private health insurance system, and there really isn't any use at all for private health insurance companies. Now, just in the short term, uh, just to get people access to care, I like of Governor Walz's One Care program. Governor Dayton was proposing letting anybody all buy into Minnesota Care, so kind of a public option. And we can do that as a state without having to worry about what happens at the federal level, where they kill off Obamacare or single payer happens. We'll, we'll still be protected. <laughs> and long term, I would like to get to something like John Marty's Minnesota Health Plan. I like basically all of it, except the timing. I think it's too abrupt. If we were to try to make a quick jump from where we are to where I want to be, we're going to get punished at the ballot box. People who are somewhat reasonably satisfied with their health insurance really hate it when political parties start touching health care. This is why Republicans got punished in 2018. We got punished in 2010 over Obamacare, even though that was kind of mild and incremental, but that's still why we got hit pretty hard with that. So we have to get to a single payer plan we have to think really carefully about the roadmap and try and do it more gradually. And then we can talk about the better aspects like, something I like about John Marty's plan is it includes dental and vision and, it's weird with health insurance, it's like your body stops at your neck, nothing <laughs> in your head counts, it's all separate. Um, and I see, kind of, when I think about the shortages of home health care workers, I see that kind of dovetailing with, with another problem which is when people's jobs disappear to automation or move away and those jobs just don't exist where they are anymore, we have retraining programs and they pretty much never have worked. And the basic thing is, after people's jobs are gone, we retrain them for a new job that is also not where they happen to live. Home, the need for home health care workers is everywhere. There's, like, there's literally nowhere in the state we can't say there are jobs here. So I think that's one place we direct our training program to is home health care, and we're going to need other medical professions too. You know, we're, you know there's always you know spot shortages, especially when you get outside the metro area with you know, nurses and nurses assistants. And so I think that's where our retraining programs need to be redirected. With the measles outbreak, I get pretty angry at the anti-vaxxers. That's why we have the measles outbreaks. It's not because our vaccines don't work. It's not because people can't get them, it's because we've got this disinformation campaign from anti-vaxxer conspiracy theorists 
convincing people that vaccines are dangerous. And all nonsense, thank you. And thank you, Mom. <laughs> um, okay, now let me get back to my rants. We, we have to counter the, the anti-vaccine propaganda campaigns. We have to educate people about this. All right, now I'm done. This next question will go first to Tyler. Uh, affordable housing and public housing access are big issues right now, especially with the growing homelessness crisis. How do you plan to address this? So, um, you know, uh, I'll just first start with uh, that housing is a human right. I was the first on this, uh, out of this campaign to sign on to uh, uh, the Homes First Guarantee, Homes for All Guarantee. And uh, I really believe that. That's one of the reasons why I'm running for, uh, for the state house is because the state is not doing enough. Right now, uh, again, we spend over $148 million for police state aids, mil militarize our police, but yet we only spend $90 million for uh, the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. Uh, and what we need to do now is make sure that we establish a renter's bill of rights to protect them uh, for, you know, making sure that landlords don't abuse their power, which is an asymmetric power, to make sure that they have representation. Uh, because when you look at the statistics, you know that there's a big disparity in those who are renting and those who are owning. Only 41% of people of color own their own home. That means that 50, what, 59% of uh, people of color are renting. And so, um, you know, that is, uh, you know, as we all know, a way to gain access into the middle class and build wealth. But and a lot of us don't have that access. Uh, further, you know, we need to make sure that we establish rent control uh, in Minnesota. I'm for that because I know the damage that it does when you see 15, 25% rent increases over one year period. And we're seeing that now. Uh, a lot of areas are gentrifying in, the, in Minneapolis, in our district right now. Uh, I remember being able to uh, see a solidly middle class neighborhood, but now I'm seeing almost half a million dollars, $750,000 homes being sold around the lakes. And this neighborhood's changing. It's pushing a lot of people out that are middle class, and it's really um, becoming gentrified, even gentrifying home ownership. Uh, so uh, making sure that we have rent control and pushing for that at the state level, because that's the only way we can get it done, because the state has established a law when the Republicans had power to say no one could do rent control, no city could do rent control, only the state can. And so uh, we want to make sure to dismantle that. Uh, further, uh, we want to create a progressive property tax, because right now property taxes, uh, the rate uh, at the state level is 10% uh, across, no matter how much the house or property is uh, worth. And so I want to have the million dollar mansions paying a bigger share of their portion towards uh, property taxes, and then uh, relieving those that are living in starter homes at $250,000, or uh, even those that are you know, at uh, mid-level. So uh, we need to have that property tax system equitable. Uh, so I'm, I'm working on trying to deal with renters, uh, the homeless by building more and just uh, establishing more uh, home homelessness uh, opportunities, those who are uh, ex-offenders, giving them access to housing, making sure that the LGBT community and those that are trans youth that are oftentimes often uh, black or brown, uh, most likely to be homeless, uh, having them making sure that they have a chance, and then also uh, taking the relief off of uh, homeowners and being able to access homeownership and then uh, take the pressure off current homeowners. So that's what I'm gonna fight for for housing. We need to ensure everybody has access to a safe, stable, accessible, and permanent home. Um, as I said in my opening, I actually remember the feeling of being on that uh, waiting list, waiting for um, a rental subsidy. We were on it for quite a while. Um, and also the relief and the stability that having access to affordable housing and, and subsidized housing brought. We know from the research, I can tell you from my own life, but we know from the research that it having a home leads to better outcomes with everything else, with housing, with, or excuse me, with health, with, um, with employment, with education. I can tell you that from my own experience and how important it was for my mom and her, as she um, worked on her um, mental health issues. Um, we've seen in this neighborhood as well as across the region, excuse me, in this, in this district, as across the region, 
Um, and I think we're seeing in the whole state of Minnesota rising rents, uh, issues of affordability, rising property taxes as the state doesn't pick up the bill on a bunch of uh, things, and, and that's hitting uh, folks with fixed incomes um, really hard. We, I think that the housing advocates say um, shelter saves lives and housing ends homelessness, and we need to do both. We need to, as we saw with the Great Fire um, and, and what's happening in, in Minneapolis and parts of Richfield, we actually need to invest urgently in shelter um, and ensure that everybody, that we are dealing with the, the issue, the urgent issue of unsheltered homelessness. Um, we also need to ensure um, that we're meeting people where they're at, so folks have shelter and can use the shelter um, no matter where they are in their, in their journey. Um, and then we need to start uh, dealing with the housing issue. Um, and I think we need an all hands on deck approach. Um, we need to ensure that we're, um, we're both providing more rental subsidies and building uh, um, um, more and providing more uh, rental units. I've been listening and learning a lot in this district. I see Judy Mo is in the back. But we've been talking about um, accessible housing ensuring that as we're building and, um, and have rental <coughs> unions, that we're units, we're actually making sure that everybody can use it and everybody can visit it. Um, we need to ensure that we're building um, more deeply affordable housing, so not just the market rate stuff or the 60% of market rate stuff, but, uh, but, but things that everybody um, has access to. And then we also need to work on the home, um, home ownership issues and reducing the disparities uh, that that, that um, brings. I think that the issue of property taxes that I think was raised is really important because another big issue in addition to being able to afford rents and stay in folks' homes and deal with issues of gentrification is that as property taxes go up because our school districts and our, um, and our cities have to pay for more and more of what the state isn't doing, um, people are struggling on fixed incomes. And so at the state level, we have to go and we have to do our responsibility to fund things um, that the city <coughs> and counties shouldn't have to. So, uh, in my opening statement, we, I talked a bit about my personal values and our community values. And I can tell you that when a friend of mine broke up with his boyfriend and had nowhere to live, he slept on my couch. He slept on my couch for six weeks, longer than I anticipated. <laughs> <laughs> but when he needed me, I was there. Now, in my mind, he should have had a place to go. I should have been able to connect him with the appropriate service after a more reasonable amount of time, and to have known that as a gay man, he would be safe in that facility. But that's not an option, and it needs to be, right? Now, in the Public Health Advisory Committee, we talked about housing for like a lot. We talked about housing so much that we created the Housing Advisory Committee for the city of Minneapolis, okay? Um, because we understand where housing fits in the system. Now, let, for instance, let's talk about education since it came up. Minneapolis schools spend $10 million busing students from one place, from, from wherever they happen to be, at the beginning, of, let's say the beginning of the month, to from wherever they are at the end of the month, because the federal law mandates that. Now at $10 million a year, you could build some housing and get ahead of that problem, right? Now, my proposal for housing is to create a fund where the state uh, invests, or where the state invests along with a new homeowner to purchase a home. Now, the general concern with a proposal like that is that the house will be flooded. Um, to combat that concern, the, I, I say we tie the sale price of this purchased home to a state mandated amount. This creates, over time, a bank of affordable housing permanently affordable housing um, that individuals own and can build equity in. I also think that we need to really think about the way we treat the stock of public housing that we have now. We need to treat it as a resource that we own and can invest in 
Because in the long term, if we do not take care of the public housing that we have, we will only have higher expenses down the road. If we're going to be good stewards of our investment and good neighbors and good community members, we have to take care of each other, even if it is inconvenient in the short term. Thank you. Well, our problem is we simply don't have enough space to build all the housing that we need. And I'm sure when I said cover the freeways, a lot of you were understandably thinking, that guy's loopy. That's right. That's, a, that's okay. It's maybe not something you thought about before, but I'm not, not the only one to come up with this idea. Um, Millennium Park in Chicago and a chunk of Dallas are smaller scale projects, like what I'm talking about, built over a railroad yard and a freeway, respectively. There have been plans in the Rondo neighborhood for a land bridge, they call, to try to reconnect some of the Rondo neighborhood. Edina's talked about this over a part of Highway 100. So I'm talking about things that are doable, but just doing it on a lot bigger scale. And if, if you've ever been, have you ever been on top of the highway, uh, the Hiawatha Avenue tunnel? I don't, if, if you think about on, on top, the roof of it is part of Minnehaha Park. Hiawatha Avenue used to just divide Minnehaha Park into Minnehaha Park and this chunk over there that we could use for anything. But with a roof on top of part of Hiawatha Avenue, Minnehaha Park is a lot bigger. You go on top, it's like any road or any bike path, depending upon how you go there. This can work, and we can, we can make this work and replace a lot of the housing that was lost decades ago when neighborhoods got torn apart. And once we put up the roofs, we can build what we want. We want to put up affordable housing? That becomes a lot more of an option because you've got land to build on. And I'm thinking that we need to stop working around the edges with small solutions and go back to the idea that the government will just build affordable housing. We got away from this because there were the big public housing projects in the 60s, early 70s that had their problems, and so now the government just doesn't do that at all. And I think it's federal law that, that, that it can't. I'm not sure what we can do. But what we can do, if we have to change the law, build housing, that we need, even if it's not profitable for the private developers. The private developers are never going to want to take on affordable housing. It's either not profitable or not as profitable as housing for the middle class or the upper class. So we're going to have to think big and just build up more of it. I support the efforts currently going on in Minneapolis um, not to close the public housing units and convert them to affordable housing. And so I think as more and more developers come in and want to take away public housing and convert it, we need to have legislation that puts a stop on that or that puts a certain percentage of the properties that can be converted instead of having all of the public housing gone. I was a part of the effort with um, the concierge apartments a number of years ago where we had a developer come into Richfield and buy the property and they uprooted a whole apartment complex of people and from that the city of Richfield gained a lot more homeless families and that are still homeless today <coughs> um, from the Richfield High School there's still at least 30 families that are um, have been affected by it and that are still affected and they have not been able to find housing so I would support legislation for more money um, definitely with the housing policy um, and issues group. And then also there's some cities um, recently that have converted different properties into homes to house the homeless um, people. And so they've gone into big malls. And so we have a lot of vacant properties around, even around our area, whether it's at the hub or at different properties around the city where we could convert some of that into places where we could house homeless for a short term. But long term, we definitely need to like work on policy and I would support policy that would require us to develop more housing for people either that have been homeless or that have, are making a certain amount of money that can move into those um, houses. So, I would um, also support the county efforts to continue
continue helping with the homelessness issue because a lot of it falls on them because they're because of the boundaries of where the housing is um, is wherever it's put at. Like when we had Tent City, that was more of a Kansas County issue, and so coming up with state legislation to help out counties and cities deal with the issue. And I know a little has been talked about renters' rights. Um, definitely, like, um, as a lawyer, I've worked in immigration law clinics and other clinics, and I think that if we have an increase in access to lawyers to work pro bono <coughs> around the state with homeowners and with renters, um, since the landlords have a, or have more access to lawyers, like, I would definitely increase the access to lawyers um, to the renters. And then the, the final question of this round, we'll start with Emma, and we'll move our way back around. So, education in Minnesota has been in the news about both funding and access for all communities. What would you do to strengthen Minnesota schools? <coughs> Public education is the cornerstone of our democracy. It's the center of our communities. It's the lifeblood of our economy, and we need to invest in it. Um, I um, am a, a Minneapolis public school kid, um, was enthusiastic, uh, Barton Open School kid, um, but I struggled to learn how to read, and I was in special education until fifth grade. <coughs> it's a community of um, uh, teachers and special educators. We. Uh, paraprofessionals and all of the adults in the building that put me on a path to success to South and then uh, college and law school um, and also uh, um, are the reason that I'm here. And I think what we know in Minneapolis public schools right now, I think it replicates itself across the state, is our disparities mean that not every kid is going to get that kind of support and have that kind of um, um, uh, investment and we need to, to fix that. I think we have to fix that by starting, um, uh, we have to tackle the achievement gap and the opportunity gaps that are leaving far too many black, brown, and indigenous kids behind. And we have to start by fully funding our public schools. Um, special education underfunding, um, but also um, fully funding our schools, starting with um, the things that we know work, right? Fully funding um, uh, uh, full service community schools. Um, we need to pass the, the increase um, uh, uh, Teachers of Color Act, which was uh, uh, co-authored by our very own Senator Patricia torres Way and um, Representative Mary kumish Um And we need to go um, and, um, and, and get ready in 2021 to do all of this. Um, this is work I've done. In 20, 2011 and 2012, um, I worked with uh, unions and nonprofits. I worked with communities uh, to, um, on a campaign we called Pay Back Our Kids. But it was after long years of uh, Palenti underfunding and cutting of public education, we had to go and make the case that we were gonna pay back what was called the school shift. Um, and we aren't even back up to pre Tim Palenti le uh, um, uh, levels right now. If we're gonna do this, it's gonna take all of us. It's gonna take communities, it's gonna take parents, it's gonna take uh, teachers unions and all of the, the, the uh, SAU who works with um, with uh, um, the folks that I've worked with, with um, uh, kitchen staff and bus drivers, it's gonna take all of us to go and make the investments that we need. The other thing is we can't forget the role that early education plays in, um, in uh, making sure that every kid comes to school ready to learn and that kids have a pathway to success. I come from a family of early childhood educators. My uh, dad's first job was at Head Start and I know how important that uh, that early um, intervention and that early um, access uh, is to, to brain development. So we need to start with the universal uh, uh, pre-K um, for three and four year olds and then go from there um, to ensure that every kid in Minnesota, uh, regardless of where their zip code is, um, has access to a good quality education. Okay, so I know the formula is to tell a nice story, throw out some buzzwords and rhetoric. But in this particular case, what we have that argues very strongly is data, okay? Minnesota currently has 147,000 open jobs. 147,000. 
And as uh, my colleague, colleague, uh, as Tyler mentioned, we are right at the cusp of the silver tsunami. What that means is that Minnesota now has more senior citizens than children in the state. Most of the senior citizens in this state believe that their savings are going to get them through to the end of their life. That is not the case. At the same time, we have an education system that is leaving people behind. That is economic lunacy. That is Minnesota's opportunity gap. We should be investing strongly in our students, particularly those students who have not seen investment historically, to ensure that they have an amazing experience in Minnesota schools, to ensure that they want to stay in Minnesota, get good jobs, and fund senior citizen services over their lifetime, because that is the only way that uh, some people end of life is going to be comfortable. It is a real, real issue. And when you talk to Republicans in the Senate, if they hold it, that is how you have to present it to them. Because you can talk racial justice to them until you are blue in the face, and you will not get into the In fact, maybe that's the reason why for the last 30 years we have not gotten anything done on the issue yet. Let's start talking data. Let's keep it real. Leave the rhetoric behind, because that is how you make progress on this issue. Right. Well, my bit of rhetoric. Um, <laughs> I wish I could say I had some uh, brand new big idea that I've never heard of before for this, but we've actually got an already existing really big idea. Public education was a big, successful idea that you could take, you know, take everybody, we're going to educate all of them, and it doesn't matter if anybody's able to pay, and it'll be run uh, by their local government, and it'll be somewhere close enough that they can go. That was a revolutionary idea when it came out. And I think we kind of need to get back to it. We've gotten away from it. We've, we're kind of nickel and diming our schools. We we're always worried we're going to you know, spend two bu 10 bucks somewhere that we didn't need to. And what happens if we overfund our schools? Uh, will the textbooks be too new? Are you know, the roofs not going to leak enough? What does overspending on school look like? I honestly have no idea. So at a state level, I don't see our role as telling people at the local level how to deal with things. Parents and teachers and administrators and local school boards know the problems that they're dealing with on the ground. We need to be willing to give them more resources. So, sorry, Republican, I want to spend even more on public education. And uh, probably not surprising, I want to get back to talking about commit to Minnesota. Now that's dealing with post-secondary education, but I want to take money out of the equation of whether people can pursue some sort of post-secondary education. Because in the modern economy, a high school education just isn't going to cut. You're going to be almost guaranteed to spend your life as a low skilled worker moving job to job and hoping for minimum wage increases because that might be the only increase you get. And it doesn't have to be that way. And if more people are going to school, great. I don't mind expanding our college campuses. That doesn't sound like that terrible of a thing to have to do to me. So we can get more people educated. And by keeping them, making them stay in the state five years and make it free, they will stay here and they will make more money from their education, they'll pay more in taxes thanks to their higher incomes, and they'll be paying it in Minnesota. So I think it, we have to get over our unwillingness to spend money. That's at the core of the issue. I believe that um, the children are our future and that we want to make sure that all children have the same opportunities and the same education so that they, in the same access, equal access to education because it helps with the development in the future. With what we've seen so far in the last 10, 20 years of not having the having higher disparities with people of color and education and not having the same level of outcomes for everyone is that people are getting left behind and since they're not having as much education, they're not able to get better jobs or good jobs to help take care of themselves. 
they're not able to have, you know, pay their rent, they're not able to purchase homes, we have disparities in home ownership, um, and then also with healthcare, we have definitely grave outcomes in healthcare because of the inability to get the same or equal access to education. And so I believe that we need to definitely fund education more than we have. I know in the last couple of years, <coughs> education bills have been cut. And so we need to restore that to the level that it was before and then increase it in areas where we're helping more students achieve in the educational system. I think that a lot of the students right now, they're experiencing things like being bullied and you know not wanting to go to school because you know they have disabilities or if there's something wrong um, with them or they even have mental illness going on so that then they stay home and they're not um, they're having higher truancy rates because of how they're treated in school and some of the teachers and some of the educators are not able to handle the students and there's even teachers that have complained and said that they've been hit or punched um, and bullied by the students. I think that the, some of the programs, like what we're seeing in, in, um, in Minnetonka, in Excelsior and other areas where they're instituting programs in schools where they're teaching kids um, about harassment and they're teaching them about bullying to be able to address it when they see it and take it to their administrators. I think some of those programs need to be taught in the city as well in, in, in our district. I think that a lot of the magnet programs that we had in the 80s and other eras were definitely strong and good for the students and had better outcomes that, than what we're having today in the public schools. And I think that they need to increase that across the city. And so I definitely support the legislation for more people of color teachers and we need to ensure that those those teachers, once hired, have the same resources um, and abilities as all other students to be able to have those students achieve at a higher level than they have been right now. Okay, I, I wrote a lot because there's a lot to talk about. Uh, so first, um, you know, when we think of our teachers, we think of, um, you know, not the assignments they've given us, but how they've impacted our lives personally, you know, how they've personally influenced us. And throughout my whole time going through Minneapolis public schools, uh, I can tell you I've never seen one teacher that looked like me, one teacher that was Latino or Latina that could explain to me what it was like to have an adult tell me to go back to my country. Um, the only Latino professional that I've ever seen, uh, to be honest with you, is Patricia Torres, right? And then my aunt and uncle and stuff. Uh, and so growing up, you know, as someone of color, you know, in Minneapolis public schools, it's hard to see that. So that's why we need to actually make sure that we have teachers of color actually getting into these communities and reflecting the population of the teachers that they teach. And to do that, we need to make sure that there's a path to get there that's not the traditional path, because the traditional path is not working. So we see ESPs, uh, education support professionals, uh, that are disproportionately people of color, disproportionately poor paid, very low wages uh, for the work that they do, and they put themselves in great uh, uh, harm's way. You know, Sometimes they get injured on the job because of uh, the kids that they're serving and stuff like that. Uh, and they oftentimes get hit with a wall where they can't actually become a teacher and get a teacher's license. So making sure that we have the teacher's licensure uh, um, be even more accessible to folks, but also listening to the, the unions as well. Uh, and so that's why I'm pushing to um, you know, also have an ESP uh, educators protections because we need to protect all of our educators because uh, oftentimes uh, you know, that's our bench for the future you know, and uh, they do a lot of work. Also, we need to fully unionize every single staff when it comes to uh, teaching from the bus drivers to the cafeteria workers to uh, and, and then you know make sure that they uh, get paid because right now in Minneapolis public schools we have bus drivers that are paid less than fifteen dollars I think and or maybe fifteen dollars you know but there's high turnover because it's a tough job and you're competing against Metro Transit that's paying twenty six and so what are you going to take if you have to put food on the table for your kids 
So we need to make sure that um, you know all of our employees there um, are uh, taken care of and they have the funding they need. And that means that as the state house representative, I have the influence of getting money <coughs> to communities. And so uh, that's why we need $4.3 billion to fully fund uh, our education system. And also we need to bridge the gaps in ESL funding and special education funding. And to make sure that schools are more LGBT uh, friendly and that there is not students that are part of the LGBT community that suffer from discrimination. Uh, and to do this, we could find money in many ways by uh, you know, legalizing cannabis and having uh, those sales fund schools uh, like we have in Colorado. And that's uh, my plan for uh, dealing with the educational issue. All right, we're moving on to the next round. Uh, of elaboration and expansion. So if there's anything that wasn't touched on, things that you're passionate about it in your life, things that you've heard other people say already or talk about, this is time for that. So we've touched on some key issues, but there are a lot of issues out there that people care about that we haven't been able to get to. Um, so we are gonna move this time, Jerome, uh, down to Emma in order um, before we move to our closing statements. Okay, okay. three minutes. Right? Three minutes for this round, yep. We have to talk about climate change. We have to talk about the fact that we have a solution to climate change. We're just not willing to take the actions necessary. And in fact, you know, climate change weaves in between all of these other issues. How do you make public education stronger? These are the climate change teach environmental science to students, mandate that. Listen to student voice. Our students are literally leaving school to strike because we're not taking enough action on climate change. You wanna get your kids back into school so they're getting educated? Take action on climate change. We wanna talk about affordable housing. We absolutely do need to build more affordable public housing, but we have to mandate that it's built using sustainable practices. We wanna talk about a public health crisis and issues Climate change is a public health crisis. So what do we have to do? And I don't know how I'm gonna do on time. <laughs> <laughs> but I like elements of the Green New Deal. We have to have uh, electric an electric vehicle grid distributed throughout Minnesota because we know that EVs make sense, but no one's gonna buy an EV unless they know they can get from here to Duluth on half a tank, right? Uh, we need to invest in preservation. We need to green our grid. We need to create renewable energy sources for rural Minnesota, because not everyone in Minnesota has ac access to Excel's renewable energy program. But more than anything, we have to take bold, decisive, immediate action to draw down our emissions. That's what's key. I don't care if it's patchwork. I don't necessarily care if it's the most elegant solution. What's important for our future generation, for that hypothetical child that Aaron and I are gonna have that's gonna share our family-sized pizza, is that we can look at them and we can say, we recognize the crisis. We knew that it was huge and that it might be a multi-generational one, but we did something. We got started. <coughs> Well, I haven't talked about myself much because I'm running out of what I'm going to do, but the fact is uh, I am kind of proud of why I did when I was a district chair. Not winning general elections because, honestly, I could have been just barely good enough to avoid getting kicked out of the job, but I still would have won the local elections. But there was never a guarantee that we we're going to get the kind of high turnout that the DFL counts on from here to win statewide elections. There was never a guarantee that we were going to get a high turnout of DFL votes. But while I was chair, uh, this district was consistently towards the top in total voter turnout, in the percent of DFL votes, and the number of DFL votes. There was never a guarantee we were going to have a strong lo local party with lots of participation that kept busy, kept doing things, kept laying the groundwork, and we did that. Uh, camp when campaigns started up the campaign season, they don't have to start from scratch around here because of all the work that we've already done. So, yeah, I'm kind of proud of that. I'm not claiming all the credit, because Nia was my vice chair that whole time. 
And I know a bunch of you in this room, you helped out the phone banks and the door knocks, or maybe you said you helped organize the prior forums, or you helped with your precinct caucuses and so on. I thank you for that. You all get to claim credit for how well this district has been doing. I'm just not shying away from claiming my share of credit. And doing that, it's a lot of organizing, it's a lot of diplomacy, because you have to get people to do stuff they haven't done before, to do something and then do maybe one more thing. You have to get people to work together when they don't necessarily like each other, when they don't see eye to eye. But we have to get everybody pulling in the same direction. And an effective chair is good at that. And I was an effective chair. I was good at that. And those are exactly the skills that are going to translate over to being a good legislator. I mean, yeah, maybe I could sit down and write some legislation. That would actually be a good thing. But it, the key thing is that relationships are, are face to face. Just like getting people in the room for a precinct caucus a little bit is face to face. You have to develop relationships. You have to be able to be diplomatic. You maybe have to work with the other party if we're in the minority. And I can do that. And I've shown I have those skills that makes me our best shot at going to the legislature and turning our big ideas into reality. So now to, to completely pivot to an issue I'd rather, I got 30 seconds to talk about something else I'm passionate about. I want to have liability insurance for guns. You have to have liability insurance to own a car. And if you drive without light, without insurance, that's a crime. The police will stop you, and they don't have to wait for you to crash into somebody. They can just stop you for that. Gun owners should have to carry liability insurance, too. So when Mr. Irresponsible Gun Owner cleans his, his loaded pistol, shoots it through the wall into your wall, and injures you, you don't have to just hope that he's got the money to cover it. So I think we need, need to try liability insurance for guns and if that means taking some guns away, I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> One of the issues that I'm passionate about is definitely the environment is climate change. Um, as an organizer, like I have organized all across the state and in North Carolina in 2016, I worked on a presidential campaign. And in dealing with climate change, um, in the area, in the rural area that I worked in, it was the bedrock of environmental justice. And in that community, they had a couple of trucks that came to the area and were leaking PCBs on the land. And then they had to dig up the land. It was a, kind of like a big lawsuit around it. And the EPA was also involved where they sued the EPA about it. And the EPA, of course, did not claim any ownership, but they did pay the community a large sum of money um, in order to clean up that area because they were dumping the PCBs in black communities. So I have seen what climate change has done to people, both on the healthcare side of people having higher um, asthma rates that have gone on in my family, and people that have had to be connected to um, breathing machines in their homes, and then also the effect that it's had on housing. There's a large number of people in rural areas that um, are living in subpar housing. And several people that I ran into when I was organizing um, had not had electricity for five months or so due to the climate and what was going on in that area. Um, so I'm, as a former scientist, and <coughs> someone with a chemistry degree, like I'm very concerned about a lot of things going on around um, the environment, including around the killing of bees and fires going on in Australia and in, in California, and then flooding issues um, and issues with the area or with the air. Um, so I would definitely want to help out more in that area when it comes to um, like helping out with the environmental in um, human resources, and then helping out um, in the area of telecommunications. So with telecommunications, um, I've studied a lot with both international telecommunications and the telecommunications in the United States. And there are satellites that are around um, like in space that each of the districts or each <coughs> of the states connect to. And I think that if we increase the telecommunications in rural areas, 
Um, then we'll have problems <coughs> with people being able to get jobs um, and not having to travel as far to the, the jobs. And then also with, uh, um, with transportation, so it'll help the state as a whole if we increase our telecommunications. All right, so um, I'm gonna touch on two issues that are really important to me that I haven't got a chance to touch on before. Uh, one is climate change. Uh, right now, uh, we are going through a crisis and we, um, you know, humanity might not survive it if we don't do the right things right now. So uh, that's why I wanna immediately, in my first term, purchase carbon offsets to offset the carbon uh, impact and the tons of carbon emissions that the state of Minnesota itself emits every year so that we show that we're responsible for our emissions. Uh, second, I want to ban single-use plastics and uh, make sure to charge companies that have uh, single-use plastics that have polluted and full, full, uh, filled our um, landfills to make sure that they are um, held accountable. Uh, I am the first to sign on to the uh, Sunrise Movement's uh, commitment to the Green New Deal and uh, to the Minnesota 350's uh, plan to not take fossil fuel money and PAC money, and so I will uh, commit to that, and I appreciate that some of my colleagues have also signed on to that. Uh, I also pushed to ban line three uh, because uh, we definitely cannot have any more pipelines in indigenous lands and uh, threatening our waterways. Uh, then I wanna touch on something that's also very personal to me and that's immigration. Uh, right now, uh, we are dealing with a racist uh, administration that really wants to deport people that look like me and the people that um, you know are in our communities. And so I wanna make sure that we pass driver's licenses for all and get it finally done because I'm tired and tired of talk and people still, every time they drive to work, every time they drive to a church or school or picking up their kids, they are worrying about their own lives and getting picked up by um, the uh, uh, you know, ICE. Then further, I would like to uh, make sure that we're sanctuary state status and hold accountable the uh, police departments that are coordinating with ICE to make sure that we uh, protect all of our neighbors and those that are undocumented as well because right now even um, we even the Sherburn County and other counties are uh, collaborating with ICE right now and it is awful condition. I, I also finally want to uh, push for an immigrant defense fund because those who are um, on the docket to be deported uh, they're 12 times less likely to be deported if they have legal representation and so uh, allocating money like the county has uh, two funds to make sure that we uh, uh, have funds for legal representation of the undocumented community. And you know, this is personal for me when mom and I and my twin sister were trying to go to Cal uh, Canada in Thunder Bay, we were separated from my mom because they didn't believe that I was her kid uh, because they thought that she was smuggling two Mexican kids because I had a different last name than my mother. And this issue is really important and personal. So that's why I wanna fight for immigrant rights and dealing with climate change. So I um, think that we have a unique opportunity in this district to do this bold progressive agenda that I think most of us, and everybody on this um, stage um, shares. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, um, in this district specifically, and I wanna talk about two reasons that we're here at the, the Minnesota DFL, or at the Senate District specifically DFL, um, both in our district and at the Capitol, I think that we, I wanna talk about what we need to do together. Uh, because 2020 looms, and what we need to do here in this district, and I think uh, that um, many of us have been organizing for years, we are at 83.1% um, uh, turnout in this district, and to beat Trump, we need to be higher. Um, Trump won, lost by 1%, uh, and so when we think about what we're gonna do together, a piece of it has to be how are we building and running a campaign to both you know, I plan to win the DFL endorsement, but to, to uh, uh, go into the summer and fall and build the infrastructure we need to beat Trump, because none of this we can do if we don't win that election. We also have a very high pers uh, participation uh, um, uh, district because of the work of a lot of folks and because of the leadership of our delegation. I think you know 83.1% is a solid B, but we can do better. Um, we also need to be a leader at the Capitol. And so in addition to doing the work here to engage communities, 
to, to um, engage across um, uh, 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 East Richfield and Minneapolis and South Minneapolis. Um, we have a unique opportunity of we are a district that has a little bit of the city and a little bit of the, of, of the suburbs, um, and we can lead. Um, when we talk about climate change, um, I was surprised it didn't end up in the questions because every person I talked to talks about climate change in this district, but both because of the leadership of Representative Jean McGinnis and because a lot of you in this room who are up there at the Capitol who are um, leading on issues because of the young folks and the scientists, we are in a position to be able to go um, and, um, and work across the district, work across jurisdiction, but that starts here. So what I am excited to talk about is how we harness the energy, the participation, the expertise, the engagement right here in the district to go to that to the capital, look across jurisdictions, city, county, um, and with our colleagues both in the in the House and the in the Senate to get this done. Um, I think we can do bigger and bolder things. I think we can do a lot of the stuff we've been talking about here, and I think this district has that unique role to play. Um, and I'm excited to do that work with you. All right, and we're down to our final one-minute pitch to the oh. folks here in the room. Uh, we are going to uh, we're going to stay in the same direction, going from Emma to Jerome uh, this time, so that we can make sure that we get through everybody. And there'll be more questions for them as we go, and they'll be happy to talk to you. But that'll wrap it up for the night. Um, so let's get it started. Great, for me. <laughs> um, here in Minnesota, I think we are, um, we have the opportunity to choose a different future, to reject the hate and the fear that's happening at the, the national level, to invest um, in, our, um, um, in our kids and our families. Um, and I think we have to do that by starting by repairing and reimagining our democracy. And I think we need to take this opportunity together. We have to fight the hate with love by investments in our kids, in our communities, in our families, and in our environment. And we have to do this together. No single legislator, no 201 uh, people up there with the governor, no elected official is gonna do this alone. We have to start by building from the ground up the roots of our democracy and ensuring that everybody has the ability to make decisions over the policy that impacts their lives. That's what I wanna do, that's what I wanna do with you, and that's why I want the DFL endorsement. Thank you. So, I am the son of uh, the union movement when it comes to the reflection of my family and the opportunities that were allotted to me. My grandfather was part of the United Farm Workers Movement when Cesar Chavez was marching against the grape growers. My father was lucky enough to be a mail carrier, and he thought that was a job that he really made it because he was in the union. And I am now uh, representing uh, the mini, uh, uh, Ashley Council 5 and my local 2864 that I organized myself because I was out of the union and I used to be in asking another job, but then I came in and was not represented. So I'm fighting for all of us, and I, I practice it with the work that I do. Uh, so I hope to, you know, fight for all of you and all of us. And, you know, también estoy postulando para casa de representantes de esta tal en nuestro distrito 63B para nuestra raza, nuestra gente en el pueblo, porque hay mucha gente que no está representado en la casa de representantes y estoy luchando para todos. So thank you so much, and I really hope that you can consider me uh, as your next representative for the State House. Thank you so much. district like I've seen the evolution of the district has been through and we are at a very important um, part of our history where we're now you know trying to elect a new representative so well, I believe definitely like I will fight for safe reliable energy efficient transportation for increased opportunities for quality education across the board and for a reduced impact of climate change on water air and ground. Um, I'll also help and fight for affordable um, quality health care for all and also affordable access to housing for all. I definitely will, you know, like I'll run for um, support for the Senate District. 
I've helped out the food district a lot in a lot of different ways and serving on commissions in other communities, um, other committees around the community, I know that I have the knowledge, experience, and worth all to be able to represent this district, and I welcome your vote at the district commission. Thank you. So this is the part of the evening where we try to summarize two hours and a few seconds for folks whose attention spans have been stretched to the maximum. I can see your body language. Thank you for listening so far. Thank you especially if you're still listening and if you're just waiting for the sound of my voice to stop so you can slightly get up and go home, I, I do understand. A very smart thing uh, I once heard said was, don't tell me what you believe in. Tell me what you plan to do and I'll tell you what you believe in. So take a look at fergusonforhouse.com and my YouTube channel, see what I propose to do, and then you can tell me what I believe in. So the last thing I'll leave you with is a challenge. Look at my platform, and if you can find a platform that's more forward-thinking and creative, good luck to you, because I don't think you will. So please support me for the DFL endorsement, and thank you. When I gave my opening statement to you, I talked to you about values. And uh, voting for me, supporting me, is supporting values in action. I told you that I care about my community. You know that because I chair the Neighborhood Association and because I chair the Public Health Advisory Committee. I told you that I care about climate change as an existential crisis. You know that because I would not be caught dead talking about banning single-use plastics oh. with a plastic bottle. I heard someone say shape. I am a member of the LGBTQ community, and the library does stay open. We have to recognize, however, that we have an important voice in our society, and right now, the only open member of the LGBTQ community, community in the Minnesota House of Representatives, Representative Cantrell, is stepping down. Okay, Please keep that in mind when considering who you support. My proposals are out there. They are good proposals. The Minnesota Hope Scholarship and it's, uh, and my time, my time is up, JeromeCEvans.com. Let's talk after. <laughs> Thank you everybody for coming out to this candidate forum. We really appreciate it. Uh, just one last pitch. Uh, myself and Tom here represent the board of the Senate District 63 BFL. Um, it does take a little bit of work and planning and money to put on these forums. We will be having another one in March, but any donations that you can leave in the can by the door, we would greatly appreciate your help in having these forums and hosting these forums and our caucuses and such. In addition, there is a sign-up sheet there. If you're interested in getting more involved with caucuses or convention planning, please leave your information there. We'd love to talk with you more and let you know about the different issues that we're working on. Uh, right now, we've got a lot of work going on with the MPHA um, and any other meetings that we'll be having and such. We'd love to see more of you at our meetings. So thank you all again thank for coming.